As church sound techs, it's really easy to get stuck in a rut or jaded, and I don't want that for you. I want you to be connected to the why it is what you're doing for church really matters, and have an idea of the big picture, what's really success in running sound at church. So today I'm gonna to share with you a short clip from an in-person training I did with the church in Colorado Springs. There were about 12 people there, which was really encouraging. Some of them new and some of them seasoned. So you got a big mix of people that were there, but we connected again why it is what we're doing matters as church sound techs. If you're new here, my name's James and I help church sound techs make every worship mix an enjoyable one. So if that's you, hit the subscribe button and let's jump in. The dignity of a worship sound tech. What is the importance of your role here at church, either in a prayer meeting or for a church service? One of the ways that we measure the value of something is you take it away, right? If you take away air, you find out how valuable that is for life, right? Uh, pretty quickly, you will cease to exist <laughs> if you don't have air to breathe. Uh, in a similar way, if we took away all the sound gear, what would our church meetings look like or sound like? What would be different? It'd be much more acoustic and maybe uh, just lower energy and intimate, but yeah, lower energy. Yeah, you would have a hard time balancing a drum kit and an acoustic guitar and three singers, right? Maybe you could have a choir with a drum kit, but you introduce an electric guitar amp into that mix, or that acoustic mix, you're not actually mixing, then thing, it puts a lot of limitations on us. So the sound system itself and operating all of it allows us to have a lot more creativity with our uh, musical presentation. And if we're gonna get cultural, it really means that we can engage the culture in the way that they like to listen to music. Now, I like electric guitars and drums, and some people don't like those, but many in our culture respond in, like, to singing with those instruments, so that's normal and natural for them. So we need to include that into our church services to help people sing or to make that, that ramp from being totally unchurched, not knowing how to engage in worship, to engaging with a congregation in worship we're introducing those instruments and those elements and those musical styles so that it makes it easy for them to transition in so that they can engage in worship and singing. Uh, because the way that the human heart is unlocked, I think the easiest is through the words that you're singing back to God. So the sound system is the critical part in making that happen and facilitating that for everybody, right? Think about your preacher. If your preacher had a very soft voice. How big of a congregation could he lead? Not very large. I mean, this room is built for acoustic reinforcement. So maybe they wouldn't have to have a very loud booming voice, but then you're tied to a building. What if you wanna have church in the park? Then that same preacher can't preach effectively to a crowd bigger than whoever's in that short distance of earshot. It also limits how long people can engage, right? Uh, if you think about a prayer context, how long are you guys doing prayer meetings? Like how long do your prayer meetings go? Usually an, Usually an hour. Some people could take an hour of acoustic guitar and singing, but if the energy wanted to come up with a drum kit and somebody was sitting just listening to an acoustic drum kit for an hour, that might be really difficult for them to keep engaging. But if you can control that same loud input device or that loud instrument and put it at a level where you have control over the amplification, then people can enjoy the dynamics of the music, but at the same time not be overwhelmed by it because we have the control of the sound system. So there are three rules to running sound. The first one is to make sound, right? Getting stuff working is winning right? Uh, a lot of times we get caught up in like all the details, but you just have to make sure that it's on and amplifying something, right? The second rule is to keep making sound, right? Make sure that it doesn't shut off in the middle so that the, the event, the prayer meeting, the church service can keep going. And then the third rule of sound is to make it enjoyable, right? So even if we're faltering and we're trying to like 
figure out number three, right? We're trying to learn the habits and the techniques to make it enjoyable. We're still on rule number three, right? We've already accomplished one and two. If you get stuff up, if you're, you know, if, it, if the service continues, even if there's a hiccup, you miss a cue or the video playback doesn't hit right away when you thought it would, or somebody walks up there and they're tapping on the mic and it's not on, and it's still okay. The event goes on and everything's gonna be all right. So we have to make it enjoyable, but that's the last part. So even if you're a, a novice and all you know is this fader makes it louder and quieter, and the mute button, it will kill it or turn it on again, you're good in my book, right? We can start and celebrate in those baby step victories that we're making sound and that meetings happen. Yeah, the vocals might be muffled. Yeah, there might be feedback on occasion, but if we keep it rolling, we're gonna be good to go. The next rule for being a, a great sound tech is to always be learning and growing. In my years of being around professionals and amateurs turned professionals, Right now, for many of you, you're like on the very bottom of the learning curve. And so every new thing that you learn is like a huge jump in your learning. But there can come a point when you're kind of like, you know, I got this, I've got this worked out, I know what to do, I know how to you know, manage stuff and get it working. There can be a point where you plateau or you have to put in a whole lot of work to get a little bit better, right? Maybe there are problems with your speaker system and you like, you know how to make the mix sound good as best you can here on the board, but to take it to the next level, maybe there needs to be some adjustment to the speaker EQ or placement or something. And those are, take a lot of energy to, to get better, but you know, the, the differences seem minor, right? And so there's the temptation after you learn something for a while to say, I've got this, I don't need to learn anymore. You know, I, I'm good. The problem is that once you think you know everything, you now can learn nothing else and you've stagnated. You've put a ceiling on top of you and there's nowhere else you can go. So you have to choose now while you're somewhat green or maybe a couple years of experience or you know what to do and need some more tips and tricks, just decide right now, I'm gonna always keep growing and learning and doing things better even if I get to the place where I think, okay, this is pretty good. So it's a lot easier to see from the outside, the people that have chosen, like, you know, I'm hot stuff, I know what I'm doing, you can't tell me to do anything any better. It seems ridiculous at this point, but it happens quite a bit. The real trick though, is to take feedback from people who you don't think are as highly esteemed either musically or technically as you. But to the one sign of maturity is that you can take feedback and criticism from somebody that you think knows nothing about what you're doing. In the same course of events, like we're trying to make the worship leader happy and the musicians on stage, we're trying to convey what they're doing out into the room, but it's gotta connect with the people out here. And so even though somebody might have an opinion that's way off base, that you're like, we're not trying to do classic rock, so it doesn't need to sound like classic rock. Right? Uh, you know, some old rocker comes up to you and they're like, you know, you know, you should crank a PV amp and make it really loud. And that's the only way amp that you should have on stage. You can hear that feedback and be able to sift through how to, you know, chew up the meat and spit out the bones of somebody that brings feedback. Sometimes you can actually have to dig and mine what they're saying to you to figure out what it is that they're really bringing to you. So if they say something, it sounds strange, you're like, okay, what do you mean by strange? Or can you show me? Or can we figure that out? Mining for feedback from people that come up to you is massively important for your growth as well. Even if they don't have the language to tell you like on your terms, what it is that's going on. So taking feedback and receiving it is one of those things that you just have to choose to do. Like I'm gonna do that all the time no matter what. And then also, also there's the times to ignore feedback from somebody that's grumpy because the loudest thing that they've heard that day is their shower, right? 6 a.m. prayer meetings at the house of prayer, you get a lot of that where somebody is not happy with any base coming through the system at all. How to be a great team. Do we have any football fans in here? Do we have any people that know anything about football? The offensive line in football 
they're the blockers that stand in front of the quarterback and keep the other team from tackling the quarterback so he can get a pass off or so that the running back can take the ball and run it through. When the offensive line does their job awesome, who gets the credit? The quarterback and the running back and the receivers, right? They all get the credit. But when the offensive line doesn't do their job, their name is mud, right? Do you, there's nothing you can say to redeem them. They are awful and terrible. Even though they may have saved the day for 20 other plays before that, you don't notice when they do their job well. And that is your job as a sound tech. You can do a fantastic job. You can do an extremely superlative job and most people won't notice. You could have like played MacGyver and fixed the like worst disaster ever coming on stage. You did rules one and two where you kept, where you made sound and you kept making sound and somebody can come up and complain about this other thing. That, and you're, you have to, to recognize you're only gonna get a lot of attention when things go wrong. And you've got to settle that in your heart now too. When something goes wrong and everybody turns around in their seat and looks behind them, I call that the sound tech solo. And we wanna to try to avoid that, but it is real and you need to be able to chuckle about it because it will make you wanna duck behind this desk or say angry words and mute stuff and walk out the back door, ask me how I know, uh, but- How do you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there have been so many times when somebody says something that's you know, not kind and considerate and you know, they also don't know that, you know, like maybe I'm subbing that day and I got out of bed even when I'm feeling under the weather to come in. Yeah, they're, you know, sometimes people don't give comments or feedback gracefully <laughs> and that can get under your skin. Being able to adapt to that is a big deal. Don't mute things and shut off the system and walk out the door. <laughs> I hope you are never tempted to do that, but yeah, again, choosing your heart now to not do that. Yeah, avoid the sound tech solo. So if you're gonna have a great team, it really starts with great leadership because if a team doesn't have an objective, if a team doesn't have clear values, if you don't know when you're winning on your team, what's the team for, right? The other part of having a great team is that you are the best asset and the best teammate for other people that are up here. So if you're the most encouraging, if you can find something positive to say about somebody else's mix, because you also know that nobody else in the congregation is gonna come up and say, hey, you did a great job today, unless it's like, you know, absolutely astoundingly amazing. I've had the best mixes of my life and nobody says anything. And it's like, you know, every hand is raised in worship and everybody's like, the worship team's so good. And I'm like, my mix was so good, but you don't even know. You guys can be for each other what everybody else, even on the worship team, doesn't even know to do for you. So always find something positive to say about somebody else's mix. Always say, at the least, hey, thanks for serving today. Thanks for coming early and sorting this out instead of being a regular congregant and sitting in the seat. Spreading encouragement really makes a difference because the other part of running sound is sometimes you feel like you're the only person that's doing it and you're like, you feel the weight of being stuck of like, I'm, I am now the only, nobody else can help me with this right now. So the more you encourage somebody else on the team, the more likely you are to have a team and not be the solo sound tech, which is different than the sound tech solo. Actually having a team, I mean like having all of you here is really encouraging for me because a lot of churches have like three people that show up and that's big, you know. A lot of the people that come in on my YouTube channel, they're like, yeah, I'm the only person and I've been the only person for six years every week and I've never had a break. That is atrocious. And I never want that to be any of you. So always build a team around you while you're doing it. I hope that encouraged you and put some perspective on your journey of becoming a great church sound tech. If you want help clarifying what winning looks like on your team, I've got a free guide for you. It's called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. You can find that through the link in the description below. Also, if you're interested in in-person training, you can go ahead and reach out. There's a link in the description below for that too. If you wanna help support the free content that I'm putting out on YouTube, you can buy me a coffee. There's a link for that down in the description below. And if you sign up as a monthly member, I'll throw your name in the credits. If you liked this video, help that algorithm out by mashing that thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe and don't ding the little bell. 
because I don't want you overwhelmed with notifications. And these videos aren't that urgent. So just subscribe to the email list so you get notified that way and you can watch it in your own time. Your mental health will thank you for not getting pinged by those notifications. All right, rant's over. You can check out more videos over here or over here, and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.